Well, good morning again, and welcome to our services at the Central Church of Christ in Hereford, Texas. This is Sunday, January the 17th. We're going to begin our, our service this morning with a reading from the Psalms. If you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn to Psalm 5. Psalm 5. The reading of this uh, psalm, James Self will lead us in our opening prayer. And then John Sublet will be leading us in our singing. Psalm 5, a psalm of David. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Heed the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. But as for me, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. At your holy temple, I will bow in reverence for you. O Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. Make your way straight before me. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Hold them guilty, O God. By their own devices, let them fall. In the multitude of their transgressions, thrust them out, for they are rebellious against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. And may you shelter them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. Will you bow with me, please? Oh, Father, as we gather this morning, those of us who are here assembled and those who are with us virtually, we, we realize, Father, and we recognize that we are in your presence and we're humbled by the fact that you are here with us. And we're so thankful for the opportunity that we have each Sunday morning to come together so that we can study your word, we can offer our prayers to you, um, we can sing songs of praise to you, we can study the lessons that Denny will give us. And so, Father, we're thankful for the continued blessings that we have that come from your teaching for us. Father, in many ways, 2020 was a, a year of challenges with the, the COVID, the disease that has come upon us and several in our congregation have been mentioned as having the COVID and we do pray for the treatment that they're receiving and that they will be able to recover in, in good, good shape. And we're thankful, Father, for those who maybe have already recovered. In going far, forward, Father, we know that this pandemic is not quite done, but we pray, Father, that we'll all maintain our vid vigilance and we'll be diligent in wearing our mask and washing hands, paying attention to the meetings that we attend and things of that nature. But at the same time, Father, we pray that we will not have the spirit of fear where we're paralyzed and we just isolate ourselves totally from uh, society and from everyone else. I don't think that's the way you would have us to be, Lord. 
We want to thank you for all of your continued blessings. Again, we thank you for those who have been ill and have recovered from the COVID or are recovering. We thank you, Lord, for treatments that Billy Trice will be receiving. We pray that these will give him some relief from pain and things of that nature. And we pray for all of us, Lord, who just have aches and pains, sometimes of older age and sometimes just of the normal aches and pains of the world. And we pray, Father, that we'll learn to, to live with those things on a daily basis. We always want to give you thanks for the, the, the word that you've left us to guide our steps. We know, Father, that there's power in your word, but there's not power if we don't look at the word and apply it to our lives. Uh, so we pray, Father, that we'll be diligent in doing those things. And we want to give you thanks again for Jesus, the fact that he did come, that he did live on earth, that he did live as a man, that he was tempted in every way just as we are, and yet he did not sin. And we're thankful, Father, that he shed his blood so that we might have the forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you for that blessing. Just thank you, Lord, for all the ways you continue to bless us. We pray that you'll be with us in our service this morning and that the things that we do will be pleasing and uplifting to you and pleasing in your sight. We pray and ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, church. As we lift our voices in praise to God, let's start with number 103. 103. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. 524. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith. But I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I'll walk a veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that 
which I committed unto him against that day. Eight eighty one. I'm satisfied with just cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land where we'll never grow old And someday yonder we will never more wander But walk the streets that are pure as gold Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely I'm not discouraged, I'm heaven bound I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a robe and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander. But walk the streets that are purest gold. Number 
to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, let's turn to 376. 376. He paid the debt he did not owe, I owed a debt I could not pay, I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, amazing grace, Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. He paid the debt and Calvary, he cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. And now I see a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. To see him on that day. I did lose thee, a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the In this life, there are things that we have to do, and then there are things that we get to do. Most of us understand the difference and the distinction. As we gather around this table, I hope we view this as something that we get to, a great, joyous opportunity in which we can marvel at the love of our God, in which we can contemplate the debt that we did, in fact, owe that has been erased as we examine ourselves as the children of God. Will you pray with me? Our God and our Father, we come together as your children. On the first day of the week, recognizing this is your day. Not only your creation, but also a day set apart, sanctified, that we might glory, glorify and honor Thee, that we might worship Thee, and that we might gather together to remember our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, this morning as we have gathered in Your presence, may we as Your children recognize the great sacrifice as we contemplate the love that You have demonstrated for each one of us. May we see the body of our Lord as it hung on the cross. May we, in some small measure, understand the pain, the suffering, and the shame that He experienced. And may we, within the limitations of our own mind, understand the burden of sin that He bore for us. And Father, as we contemplate those things, may we also remember that He rose again and triumphed over both sin and death. 
And Father, as we partake of this bread this morning, may we see and understand the importance of that sacrifice. May we recognize the body. And in doing so, may we glorify not only our Lord, but also you as our God. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Our Holy Father, at this special time this morning, a special time to remember Jesus, the life that he lived, the death that he died. Without this, Father, we would have no hope. Help us now, Father, as we continue our thanksgiving for this cup, the fruit of the vine which represents the blood that he shed. May you do that way pleasing to you in Jesus' name.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to be gathered together. As we gather on the first day of the week, we pray for our giving. We pray that each one will give from the heart to the betterment of your gospel there on earth. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. You ever taken some time to walk through a cemetery? Look at the inscriptions found on the gravestones. Very often you'll find descriptions of a person, something briefly stated about their life or something describing the one who is buried there. And this is especially true in older cemeteries. First time that Linda and I went to Scotland in 1982, we went to some old cemeteries. And we did this partially because she has Scottish ancestors. And we made connections with a man who uh, uh, was the head of the clan that her ancestors came through. And he took us around to some of the old stomping grounds of that family. I don't remember what headstone this is. It's huge. It was taller than me and probably about this wide. And couldn't read a lot of it. But it had a lot on there about what this man did when he was alive and what kind of a person that he was. And you perhaps see that some here, maybe more back in the eastern part of, of the United States, but uh, some here that uh, describe them and uh, look around in cemeteries uh, today and you see descriptions uh, like she was a good mother, sainted father gone to heaven, uh, beloved husband, faithful father, words along that line, uh, some with longer inscriptions, some with shorter. Uh, one thing I read in, in, in preparing for this lesson talked about a cemetery where there was a grave of a, of a little girl. 
that had passed away very early in her life. But in the granite marker for her grave were these words, a child of whom her playmates said, it was easier to be good when she was with us. What an epitaph that is. Very brief comment on this little girl's example. And I, and I bring it out, and the author I was reading brought it out, I'm sure, because it, it, it leads right into what I want us to talk about today. Her example uh, illustrates how crucial it is for Christians to maintain good influence. As Christians, you and I now have the most powerful influence for good that we have ever possessed. Our Lord said, in referring to this power, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Matthew 5, verses 13 and 14. If we ignore the power of the influence that we have, it's a very foolish oversight on our part. As Christians, we are expected to to utilize this, this new power of personal influence in order to glorify God. This morning, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look beginning in verse 7 and go down through verse 14 uh, and reflect on some of the things that Paul says there as he talks about our influence as children of God, our influence as those who, who are Christians in this world. And the first thing that he says as we look at this is that we are to walk as children of God of light. Christians who refuse to live according to their own, uh, as Christians, we refuse to live according to our old ways. We don't want to walk in those anymore. And so there are various types of people that we avoid. Verse 7 here, he says, therefore do not be partakers with them. The with them refers to what he's just been talking about, what we looked at last time, uh, actually in the, in the video last time, since we didn't meet uh, here live last Sunday. But he's been talking about those who, who deceive and those who uh, practice the immoral things that he talked about verse, back up in verses 3 through 5. Instead of... of Living that way, we uh, now live lives in a manner that is characterized by light. We no longer walk in darkness. And Paul goes on here to give additional reasons for uh, not getting involved in the evil conduct of, of immoral people. He bases it now not on the future coming judgment that he talked about in the verses leading up to verse 7. But now he talks about uh, about it based upon the pa- our past and our present. The difference between what we once were way back before we became Christians and what we now are. It's a, it's a great contrast between Darkness and light, just opposite extremes of conduct and of the way we ought to live. The whole paragraph here, as we consider it, plays on on the very rich symbolism of darkness and light. The contrast between the two. Darkness represents ignorance and evil and pagans and the the departure and walking away from God that that they practice and that we, before we became Christians, also practice. Light represents truth 
and righteousness and Christianity and being Christians and serving and doing and being all that God wants us to be. If you go back in chapter 4 here of Ephesians, in verses 17 and 18, Paul had, had portrayed there the, the darkened understanding of pagans. And now he states that, that Christians in the past, that we were the same. In verse 8 here of chapter 5, he says, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, walk as children of light. Now notice there in verse 8 as he speaks, he doesn't say that we used to be in darkness, but are now in light. Well, that's true, and it's written elsewhere that way in, in other places in the New Testament. For example, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5, 6, and 7 were uh, stated in that way. But what Paul says here in Ephesians 5 is even more striking. We ourselves are actually now light. Our lives have actually been changed from darkness to light. And that radical transformation has taken place in the Lord. Because we are now part of His body, because we are now part of His bride, the church, and that's the whole overall theme of everything that we're looking at here in Ephesians. It has taken place in the Lord by means of our being united with Him who is the light of the world. John 8 verse 12. So, because we have become light in the Lord, we are then to walk as children of light. Our behavior must conform to our new identity as Christians, as those who are, who are light, as those who are in the truth, as those who practice righteousness. And we must, indi uh, we must radiate that light and live and walk as children of light. Well, what does this mean in practice? How does, it, how does it come out? How does it manifest itself? Well, Paul answers that when we come to verse 9. He writes there, and he says, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, and righteousness and truth. It, it's going to mean that we live a life that is shining with goodness and righteousness and truth because these things are the fruit, what's produced by the light. Let's think about these three for He says, first of all, goodness. Goodness is, is that virtue which emphasizes kindness and helpfulness. A person who is known for, for his goodness is one who is full of positive thoughts and positive attitudes. He is one who is always accomplishing good deeds, always doing good deeds. He has a good heart that, that causes him to practice good behavior in the life that he lives. Now, how should the, how should the Christian's conduct cause him to be filled with, with goodness? Well, he treats everyone with kindness. Everyone with justice. He doesn't take advantage of anyone. His life is described in, in this way and he... He defends those who are being oppressed by, by others who, who are not in the light. Practicing goodness involves discipline. It involves rebuke. It involves instruction. 
as well as love and consideration and help. The one who is controlled by goodness will not agree with evil. It will not, he will not allow evil to go unrebuked also. And he will do whatever he can to stop evil by speaking out against it and demonstrating against it by the life that he lives. Then he says, another fruit of the light is righteousness. Righteousness implies that a person is right and does right. Now, understand, it's kind of interwoven with what we've just been talking about of goodness. The Christian's influence is governed by righteousness in such a way that he continues to be in a right relationship with God and continues to live righteously in doing or by doing what God expects. Living as one who is in the light, light as he is in the light, as the passage from 1 John 1 that we cited earlier mentions. When one comes to faith in God and obeys God's commands, he is created in righteousness. Ephesians 4, verses 23 and 24. A heart then that is filled with, with righteousness helps that person to maintain the, the proper influence that he needs to have in this world because he desires to be right with God and do right, do what is right in God's sight. And whenever he is confronted, he or she is confronted with a moral or an ethical choice, righteousness reminds him to ask, is it right with God? Is it the way God would, would have you live? Is it the right thing to do in walking in righteousness and manifesting this fruit of the light? And then there is the fruit of truth. Christian's influence is Proper because he follows absolute truth. When we think about the world that we live in, when we think about the, the business deals that go on and the activities of this world, we see that, that the world for, uh, for the part of many use lies and deception. I'm not saying everyone does, but you know that there's a lot of that that goes on. The ungodly do not want to accept the fact that truth is absolute. Everything is relative to them. They, they, you know, it just varies. It depends, they'll tell us, on what the circumstances are. But those of us who know God recognize that truth exists. And we realize that and are careful to remain consistent with that truth and thus consistent in our influence, knowing that God's truth remains the same. It doesn't change and ebb and flow with the tides and change with the circumstances. Many people seek to follow truth as long as it's convenient or as long as it's comfortable for them to do so. Sometimes when people begin to, to realize that the truth of God is contrary to what they want to do, they become upset. And they determine to do what they want to do rather than the truth revealed in the Word of God. A godly influence belongs to the Christian who will carefully and consistently follow the truth and make that a, a part of the fruit of the light in his life, along with kindness and righteousness. Moving on to verse 10, Paul writes there and he says, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Now that's Paul's describing there the way that we make choices 
as Christians. In, in that expression, trying to learn. The Greek term translated trying to learn here is translated in other places as proving or approving. As Christians, we guard our influence by thinking, evaluating, testing the choices before us to determine what the Lord would have us to do. What's the Lord's instruction? What principles does the Lord give us? The Bible gives us knowledge. God in His Word has, has revealed to us the things that, the principles that we live by, the absolute truth of God. God's Word teaches us those principles, but it does not free us from our responsibility to think about the situations and apply those principles and choose the godly option. And so that results oftentimes in a conflict in our lives. And that's verses 11 through 14. Reading those, Paul writes and he says, Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. As Christians, our influence is to be strong enough that it will expose the darkness of sin. Too many Christians have remained silent and allowed the dark deeds of sin to go unchallenged. Sin, and, and, and we see it, we recognize it in our world. Sin is becoming and has always been, but becoming perhaps more, more evident. Sin is becoming so bold that even the most shameful practices are openly discussed publicly. And a word of reproof is spoken. The boldness of sin often intimidates us as Christians. Christians whose influence is then weakened by our silence. To counter that kind of timidity, the Apostle Paul wrote, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, in the beginning of verse 8, and he says, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. The spirit that we have from God is to be one of boldness because we are speaking from the absolute truth of God, the creator of our world, the one who has all authority. One of the greatest temptations for Christians comes in the area of participation with those who can compromise our influence. That's why Paul said back in verse 7, do not be partakers with them. As Christians, we are obligated to stay away from activities that are associated with darkness and not light. You see, darkness feels comfortable until light exposes it. John 
3, verses 19 and 20, Jesus paraphrasing Jesus' words there. The Christian never enhances his influence by deciding to participate with those who are doing things that are disgraceful, that are evil, that are sin, that are darkness. Conflict will come. We're going to face it. It's going to be part of our lives as we make choices to please the Lord. And the challenge for us is not to allow the conflict to compromise our influence. Not to allow it to to darken us, but rather to take the light that is in us from Jesus and from from God, God's Word, and expose those, those sinful works of darkness. Our influence must help to enlighten others about truth and about righteousness and about goodness, the fruit of light. We must not be silent because we are are obligated to be a force in our culture. We are, are to expose that, to be salt and light. Salt and light would be useless if they had no power to influence their environment. That's why Jesus said that salt that has become, has lost its savor, is not good for anything but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Back there in in Matthew chapter 5. Godly influence that Paul is advocating here in Ephesians chapter 5 is to be aggressive. It is to be working to expose evils and to awaken the unsuspecting who are involved in sinful deeds. Christians can find wonderful satisfaction by influencing the world so that good results. And the challenge from Paul to do that very thing is found here. Ephesians 5 verses 7 to 14 is filled with cautions for Christians. We need to be careful to guard our influence. If we become careless in our living, we we could and will lose our impact upon the world in which we live. And how tragic that is. How tragic when it is when a, when a Christian allows their decisions to destroy their influence for good. Some choose such lifestyles. Such lifestyles that, that their impact for good is, is, is knocked powerless. And this could happen because of uncontrolled temper, Rash words, vulgar language, vulgar habits, uncontrolled passions, worldly pursuits, any number of improper practices that we find common in the world, but that should not even be named among us. Remember that as As a Christian, you have been sanctified as God's own possession. And therefore, we are to demonstrate that fruit of light, goodness, righteousness, truthfulness, demonstrated by the very life that we live in all of our actions, our deeds, our words. Of course, those things come out of our thoughts. And those thoughts must be molded and guided and framed by God's Word as we make it a part of our lives, put it into into our minds and, and from our minds into practice and the actions that we live every day, realizing we are salt. We are light. We have jobs. 
to do. Functions, if you will, in God's kingdom. The church. The bride of Christ. It all begins with obedience to the gospel. It all begins in that point where we are baptized into Christ, where, where we are taken from the, the world and the realm of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's own dear Son, Colossians chapter 1. Born again of water and of the Spirit to walk in newness of life, to walk in the light of God's Word. Bearing the fruit of life. If you've not done that, then the opportunity is always present, always available. But the opportunity is yours right now to do that. Or maybe as one who has your influence, it's not as strong as it needs to be. For whatever reason. Maybe you need to ask God's forgiveness. Maybe you just simply need your brothers and sisters to pray for you that your influence and your decisions can be stronger in the Lord. If there's something we can do to help you in any way, won't you make it known by coming as we stand and we sing? Number 552. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am wet. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I Closing song, we'll just do uh, 553. 553, we'll sing uh, the first verse of that song, and then we'll ask Mike if he would come and lead us with a closing prayer. My life, my love, I give to thee.
pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity that we've had this morning to be here and more accurately learn from your word. We pray that we'll allow your word to mold our lives and to mold our thoughts and to help us control the actions that we take in this world. We're thankful for the love that you had for us and the sending of your son and the promises that you've made to us. We pray that we can balance our thoughts on you and your word with things that affect us in this world and pray that you'll be with those of our number who are affected by COVID and pray if it be your will that all the means being taken to return them to normal health will be successful and they'll be back in our number and Pray that you'll be with those families that are most affected, that if there's anything we can do to help them, that that will be done. And pray for this country and pray that the godless views that we see starting to permeate our nation will not continue and that we will always have an opportunity to teach others of your love and to be a shining light in this world and forgive us when we fail you and pray that you'll watch over us this coming week as we leave this place in Christ's name.